When I cross the line and break, I can stay another day. Let me in. Immigration. Shannon Wolfham, and I am the Executive Vice President of the Penn State Economics Association. And welcome to the 2016 Great Debate. Hi guys, my name is Joe Kearns. I'm the Vice President of Education for the Econ Association. We have a great topic in store for you tonight. The topic, of course, is illegal immigration. And we have two teams filled with great debaters for you. First, I'll introduce the students to you. Uh, on the pro team, with Jared, we have Jonas Dunnikin, uh, Connor Chess, and Ayad Muhammad. And on the, on the team that uh, is arguing that it's a net loss, we have, uh, on Amanda's team, we have Will Patton, Arjun uh, Sinha, and Jordan Smith. All right. Today on this beloved holiday of St. Patrick's Day, everyone wants to claim some sort of Irish heritage. Whether you're actually Irish or not, however, the fact is that almost everyone in this room today is a descendant of an immigrant. Many people incorrectly believe that if you support the immigration laws in the United States today, then you are anti-immigrant. Nothing could be further from the truth, and that is what we intend to prove today. We argue that illegal immigration into the United States offers our country a net loss as a result, and it is also equally harmful to those immigrants themselves. As a preview to tonight's debate, let's look at several points. First, we frequently hear the word cheap labor tossed around and used synonymously for illegal immigrants. However, do we really want to be basing our economy off of cheap labor instead of developing better technology and innovations? Secondly, there can be no doubt that there will be a financial burden on our country as a result of the many resources that are going to these non-taxpaying individuals. Finally, we will look at some of the troubling statistics that we have seen emerging in recent years that relate to the illegal immigrant population and crime trends that we have begun to see. Now, the focus of tonight's debate is specifically looking at the net harm done on the U.S. economy. However, we would also suggest that there are many negatives that the illegal immigrants themselves are going to feel as a result of coming in and breaking the laws. First, let's return back to that term, cheap labor. What we can really think of this is as, as another way of saying that this is an opportunity for American employers to exploit these hardworking individuals. They don't have to pay them even the minimum wage, and the employers aren't, holding them, aren't held to the same safety standards in terms of workplace conditions. Consequently, it may not come as such a surprise that many of these individuals would in fact turn to a life of crime, which may seem like a more profitable alternative. Finally, while these individuals do get to enjoy some of the benefits of being in this country, they will never fully get to appreciate all of the advantages of being an American citizen. They can't withdraw Social Security, and they'll never be able to vote. These laws are not intended to be discriminatory against a group of individuals. Instead, like stoplights and traffic signs, they are intended to ensure order within our country. And all people are welcome into this country as long as they are willing to follow the set of laws that are in place. We argue that if they do not follow these laws, there will be consequences for everyone. So tonight, on St. Patrick's Day, we propose that we are all Irish and we are all immigrants. So let's respect those laws that were intended to protect both the U.S. economy and those who would like to become a part of our country. Thank you. Um, well, first, I would like to thank the EA and thank all of you for coming out. Uh, to this great debate. I would also like to thank our opponents for valiantly trying to make a losing argument, okay? I'm glad that uh, Mandy brought up the fact that we are all Irish today. I wore my greenest possible shirt so that everyone could see. Unfortunately, what the other team is trying to do is paint a picture of legal immigrants, undocumented workers today, the exact same picture that was painted about Irish immigrants when they came to this country. Irish immigrants were derided for being the source of criminality, for being a drain on government services, for taking the jobs of hardworking Italian citizens that had emigrated earlier. All of these points were false then, 
about Irish immigration, and they are false today. Immigration is a net benefit to the United States economy, and illegal immigration is an even greater benefit to the United States economy. There is no difference, fundamentally, from the perspective of the economy between an illegal immigrant and a legal immigrant. Both persons work and pay taxes. The only difference that our esteemed colleague has already pointed out is that illegal immigrants don't get the benefits. They pay the taxes, they'll pay Social Security their entire lives, they will never get to receive those Social Security benefits. How can they argue that illegal immigration is a net drain on the economy when they have already ceded the point? My team will show that illegal immigration is a source of economic growth. Even in the states that experience a high degree of illegal immigration, such as Texas or Arizona. We will also show that illegal immigrants complete our workforce. They fill the gaps in the labor force that are not currently being filled by citizens. And lastly, we will show, as has already been admitted by the other team, that illegal immigrants, in fact, reduce federal government deficits. They do not function as a net drain on the economy. In fact, they benefit the economy, as all immigrants do. Thank you. All right. So please give a, a warm welcome to Will Patton. Uh, you got four minutes, Will. From where you start. Throughout this country's history, millions of people have left their homelands in search of a new life in this country. People, immigrants, like my great-grandparents from County Donegal, have come here for many different reasons. Some to practice the religion of their choosing, others to own land. Today, there is little argument about the importance of immigration within the history of this country. And Cheap, low-skilled labor can be beneficial for some. However, illegal immigrant labor is in direct opposition to some of this country's most cherished values. I'm here today to discuss the harms of illegal immigrant labor. Roy Beck of the Washington Post reveals that historically, from 1776 to 1965, immigrants entering this country averaged 230,000 per year, but the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965 allowed these numbers to skyrocket, and they've averaged off at about a million a year since the 1990s. In addition to the exponential growth of this population, two other harms include unfair competition and suppressed wages. First, employers who engage in a low-wage strategy by employing illegal immigrant labor undercut law-abiding employers. For example, in many industries, such as construction, tradesmen report that illegal immigrant labor has allowed competitors to bid down contracts. In fact, according to a carpenter in Massachusetts named Ron Vigil, a 57-year-old man, a job that used to pay over $2,500 now pays less than half of that. This is not the only form of unfair competition. Law-abiding employers cannot compete with com companies who are not adhering to labor standards, minimum wage laws, and other red tape associated with legal labor. But second, illegal immigrant labor suppresses the wages of low-skilled Americans. In 2014, the Pew Research Center revealed that illegal immigrants contributed 8 million people to the workforce. Now, it is safe to assume that most illegal immigrants are low-skilled laborers. And if all low-skilled laborers have similar skills and work in similar industries, such as service or construction, then it would follow that the addition 
of these 8 million illegal immigrant workers to the workforce would in fact suppress wages for low-skilled American natives and <clears throat> low-skilled American legal immigrants as well. In fact, a study by economist George Borjas found that illegal immigration suppresses native wages by over $100 billion a year, or 2.5%. An example of the negative implications of suppressed wages are right-to-work laws. Right Right-to-work laws in this country suppress wages of low-skilled Americans and have been shown to foster high levels of poverty, infant mortality, high levels of infant mortality rates, and high levels of workplace fatalities. In conclusion, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton in 1993 said that the American dream that we were all raised on is a simple but powerful one. If we work hard and follow the rules, we should be, able, we should be given the chance to go as far as our God-given ability will take us. Illegal immigrant labor in this country undercuts the American dream for our country's most vulnerable citizens, the uneducated, the poor, and the low-skilled. And we must reclaim the American dream for this subset of society. You have, 30, you have two minutes to do a rebuttal. You can throw this guy for 30 seconds. 29. Okay. So first, I'd like to address the fact that these illegal immigrants that are here suppress wages, because this is entirely not true. And let me tell you why. Illegal immigrants take up 53% of the agricultural workers. That's 2.5 million reported by the Department of Labor. If these illegal immigrants were not there, then there would not be a company, as there would not be an efficient amount of workers, which would cause a shortage, causing the businesses to fail. Now, I have a reference. It's a small microeconomic example, so I don't have to spit any more numbers at you, so you can really understand. And this was given by the Wall Street Journal, actually four weeks ago, about a pepper farm in Arizona. A pepper farm in Arizona was for hard regulation. That owner did not think that illegal immigrants should be there and that Americans should be working. And he found out, as soon as those workers left, he could not find them. So, wage suppression, right? He increased his wages. He still could not find any more workers. And in fact, that business ended up failing because he could not find any more pepper farmers. And if you think that a technology can replace picking strawberries, peppers, or tomatoes, then you are 100% wrong. And if you do have that technology, please tell me because I'd like to invest because you'd be a billionaire. Okay, now from uh, Jared's team, uh, Jonas, it's going? All right, please welcome Jonas Dunnikin. Hey everybody, thanks for coming out, especially for the students here for extra credit. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna talk about the economic impact of illegal immigrants in the United States and in our economy. So let's take a look at this picture. This is just random uh, citizens in New York just walking down the street. And they're people just like legal immigrants are. They're here to work and they're here for economic, economic opportunity. That's it. And by doing so, they help us as well. And they help us through something called remittance payments. Now, remittance payments are when uh, somebody sends money from the United States back to their countries of origin. And in this graphic up here, you can see the top three countries are Mexico, which is the biggest one, China and India, which follow really closely by each other. Now, in this, my remittance argument, we're gonna look at two um, main arguments within this giant argument. One, the, uh, financial, the impact on the financial system, and second, um, how it's gonna help our economy using exports. Now, let's look at the fees that we make um, using through remittance payments. One, that the total amount of remittance payments in 2009, which is the closest statistic I could find, was $48 billion from illegal immigrants only, total. That doesn't include legal immigrants. The fees added on top of that $48 billion was 9%. And the revenue made from those fees totaled $4.32 billion in 2009. Now let's take a look at this in an even closer context. How many Chipotles could you buy with this? Hold on, I'll get to that in a second. You can buy about 610 million burritos. 
and about 1.08 Donald Trumps. <laughs> now, let's take a look at this impact. This has the potential of being a $500 billion industry if we choose to take the road to expanding it. Not only will we, in, not only will we gain a $500 billion industry, but we'll also gain f new customers from poorer regions around the world. They're going to be more financially literate, and more financi with that financial literacy, they'll be able to get more bank loans, they'll be able to use more products and services from our banks. And we're already seeing this through the expansion of Citibank in Mexico and in Central and South America. Now let's take a look at exports. All right, so I'm sure you guys are all familiar with exports, but I'm going to give you a brief rundown. Money goes from the United States into Mexico. They buy our stuff and we sent, because we sell it to them. Now we're going to take a look at the biggest, one of the three biggest beneficiaries of these um, exports. The first one being Arizona. Arizona's exports increased by... Uh, or is it Mexico? Yeah, Arizona's exports increased by 13% in 2009. Most of this was due from electronic parts. Mexicans became more familiar with um, our with uh, our our what we exported to other people because they had more money to do so. Now let's look at the biggest contributor, California, which is about 14%. And they increased 14% because Mexicans started buying more plane parts from us. And that's solely from the fact that we're sending money home. They're, uh, illegal immigrants are sending money home, and they're buying things from us. And this is not only happening in Mexico, but happening in other countries as well. India and China and Mexico just happen to be the, the three biggest. Now, what about you? How does this impact you? One, we're expanding industry that's already in the United States, and we're creating an industry that ha doesn't exist yet, which is potentially worth $500 billion, which means jobs for you, jobs for me, jobs for everybody. Thank you. 30 seconds to figure out what you want to do, and then two minutes for a rebuttal. So Jonas talked up here about a little bit about remittances, exports, and some other economic benefits that uh, illegal immigrants supposedly provide. Let me talk to you a little bit about remittances. Based off a of Forbes article, the IRS says that illegal immigrants can file and claim refunds for the last three years under the Earned Income Tax Credit. So they can, they can earn remittances. But let me tell you, 70% of those remittances go back to Mexico. That's money we're losing off the top right there. On top of that, they game the system. The same program that they use has been known for billions of dollars being used in fraudulent funds. Lastly, nextly, excuse me. What if you never reported any income as an illegal immigrant? Under President Obama's executive action, an illegal immigrant can get a social security number, claim the earned income tax credit for three open years, and the IRS sends three years of tax refunds back to them without any true credibility to who they are and how they're in this country. Nextly, Jonas talked a little bit about exports. This is good because illegal immigrants are a little bit like slave labor. Their wages are depressed. You're not giving them the right amount of conditions, the safest conditions, and you're giving them grueling hours. This is kind of like what happened in the Roman Empire in the South. Slave labor weakens nations by reducing ex exports, hindering technological innovation, and turning employers lazy, since they are virtually guaranteed a profit at a low cost. Lastly, I believe you touched, was it 4.2 billion that you talked about? 4.32 billion? Okay. Um, that's a great number. But $60 billion are earned by illegal immigrants each year, and take that with the 70%. That's going back to Mexico. That's Mexico's largest revenue stream. And it consists of money sent by illegal immigrants back to Mexico. So is Jonas's argument completely true? No. And I think you need to look at the statistics to really find out what the truth is here. Okay, so now we're going to go back over here. Who's up next, guys? Uh, Connor? Ayed? Arjun. Oh, I've got the wrong. Yeah, I'm sorry, Arjun. Arjun Sinha is going to go for, the, uh, for Mandy's team. All right, so give him a welcome.
Evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, moving in, first of all, it's important for us to understand the motion itself and the background of the motion before we delve into the arguments which explore the different nuances of illegal immigration and the repercussions it has on the economy. You see, there is a reason behind why the state refers to them as illegal immigrants or illegal aliens and not as illegal citizens. The state has always made a clear distinction between a citizen and a non-citizen. Now, why is it important for us to know this today? That is because a citizen is afforded certain privileges that the non-citizen is not. It's something that has happened since the times of ancient Rome. Will and Jordan here, and practically everyone on stage here, have certain privileges by virtue of being born in this country that I don't. And I accept that because that is the law. Illegal immigration is equivalent to a person ignoring that law and trying to take that privilege by force. And we tonight have people here trying to convince you that that is somehow good for you. Now, let's uh, look at it from a human perspective. Any immigrant who is in the United States illegally does not have the basic rights and amenities guaranteed to any regular citizen. And these people have undertaken extraordinary journeys, in many cases risked their lives to get to US soil. The consequence, though, is that despite of their incredible journeys, they in the future will never be able to become doctors or engineers or lawyers or gain any skill that will allow them to be a part of the skilled US workforce. And that is at a time when the United States is transitioning into a highly skilled service economy. Our friends here are still trying to convince us that illegal immigrants are somehow good in the long term. Illegal. There's a difference between illegal and legal. Understand that. Now, going into another area, first, common sense would dictate that if you are an illegal immigrant fleeing your country, when you get to the US, you will work hard in whatever job you get, obey the law, and be respectful of this new country you now want to call your home. Yes, that may be true for a certain number of illegal immigrants, but definitely it's not true for all. According to the Texas Department of Public Safety, the most vicious American gangs who are known for their violence and their ruthlessness, such as the MS-13 and the 18th Street Gang, have been, quote, energized by the influx of illegal aliens into the country. So much so that the department published a 19-page report basically saying that the problem of this massive influx of illegal immigrants into these gangs is expected to grow, and that is on top of the existing gang crisis. And this is, these gangs operate not just in one state, they operate throughout the country. Here's what's really fun about illegal immigrant incarceration costs. According to the National Review, the American taxpayers pay a recurring cost of close to $2 billion to house illegal immigrants in American jails. And finally, I would just say, we here today ask you for your vote, not because we're not empathetic towards illegal immigrants and their struggles and their journeys. We, in fact, acknowledge the benefits that they provide to certain parts of the economy. But we have proven here, but we here, compiled with the arguments of my friends, prove here that those benefits are far outweighed by the costs. We are asking you to vote for us as it is important for us to acknowledge a harm before we go on about correcting it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great night. Okay, you have two minutes for a rebuttal. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm actually glad that the opposition brought up this point on crime because I literally had so much on it that I had to take it out of my actual speech. Um, but before we move into this commentary on crime, let's look at, let's look at what the reality of uh, illegal immigration with, with uh, correlation to crime is. So uh, several statistics have shown between 1990 and 2013, we know that illegal immigration has increased uh, all the way up to over 11 million undocumented immigrants in the economy. However, coinciding with that increase has been a 48% decline in both violent and property crimes across the United States. How does that, 
How does that support the opposition's argument that somehow an increase in Ill illegal immigrants is correlated with an increase in crime? Because the data surely does not support that. But we're not saying that in more immigrants leads to lesser crime. We're, we're just making the point that clearly it does not increase crime. But even if we look at the federal murder statistics on illegal immigrants, we know, we see the fact that 9.2% of illegal immigrants account for uh, federal murder, murder cases. However, those federal murder cases, 9.2% equal only eight cases because of the fact that federal court cases are such few, uh, 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 that such few cases are ha handled at the, at the uh, federal level. And when we compare that to the FBI statistics on 14,196 murders committed across the United States, and compared to just eight, which equates to 9.2%, we realize how skewed the statistics are in the, uh, in the argument against illegal immigration and correlation to crime. In fact, a lot of studies show that native-born U.S., and that compared to native-born U.S. citizens, Illegal immigrants are two to, two to five times less likely to be incarcerated than those people. So putting all these arguments in a perspective, looking at the actual stats, not, not skewed statistics, we can, see, we can see this larger picture, the reality that, that, uh, that there is no correlation between in illegal immigrants and crime. And on that note, we are proud to propose. Thank you. Okay, I believe we have one last argument on each side. So who's going up here? Uh, Connor? Connor Chess. Good evening. Today I'll, tonight, I will be showing how crucial the undocumented workforce is and how they support the continually growing demands in our labor force. First of all, there seems to be a common misconception that migrant workers take our jobs. However, they are not taking our jobs. They are taking low-skilled labor jobs that empirical evidence shows are not being taken by American citizens. In fact, through further economic research, it was shown that they are not even competing for the same low-skilled, low-wage jobs. And this is shown by the fact that the top two non-GED occupations for migrant workers and for undocumented immigrants are different. So let's take a look at that. The top two undocumented jobs are maids and cooks, and the top two jobs for natives are cashiers and truck drivers. Now, to further reinforce this, one of three migrant workers don't have any form of high school education, and thus are indeed taking these jobs, as it is the only thing that they are qualified for. With that being said, migrant immigrants do not compete with our labor force. They complete it. They meet the demands for industries like agriculture, construction, and hospitality, demands which are not being met by the more educated American labor force. Putting this into terms of the benefits outweighing the cost, that's what we're arguing tonight, certain segments of the U.S. economy, particularly agriculture, are entirely dependent upon these undocumented immigrants. In fact, the Department of Labor reports that 2.5 million farm workers, that's 53%, are undocumented immigrants, while Texas alone reported that a removal of undocumented immigrants would decrease their entire labor force by 6.3%. So speaking in terms of costs, a massive labor shortage and subsequent price increase on all subsidized goods and items would be far more costly than anything the opposing team is positing tonight. How costly? Well, looking at one of the many price increases across several industries filled with migrant workers, one item widely overconsumed today is milk. And the National Milk Producers Federation claims that retail milk prices would increase by 61% if the undocumented labor force were to be eliminated. And to further expound this, this is just one item from one sector, agriculture. This volatility in terms of price increases and massive shortages leading businesses to fail is not what our economy needs right now that is still stagnant after the 2008 recession. In fact, this major of a change in prices that have been subsidized for many years could spark a national recession, a large recession, that is. So how does this personally affect us, except for having a massive recession and none of you guys getting jobs, uh, especially us about to enter the labor force? Well, in addition to the fact that they keep our labor market stable and complete our labor force, they also complement U.S. workers. And how is that the case? Well, this steady labor force 
and subsequently efficient output that the migrant workers supply increases demand for skills that natives, especially all of you here tonight, possess. For instance, when you add more laborers to agricultural companies, that increases the demand for more managers, managers, economic analysts, accountants, the efficient level of workers, that is, which raises their wages. A lack of workers or a shortage does the exact opposite and makes businesses fail. With businesses running smoothly at maximum output in labor, the businesses can expand and hire more American workers, particularly Americans in the shrinking middle class. With all being said, it is clear that the benefits by far outweigh the cost in terms of our economy and the entire low-wage labor force that supports it. A low-wage labor force that educated Americans are not filling, as I have shown to you multiple times. Thus, these vital, hard-working migrant families of both adults and children do not compete, but complete, and thus complement the U.S. labor force. Thank you. <clears throat> Whenever you are ready, Mr. Professor McLeod. All right, Connor, thank you very much uh, for that argument. Uh, so I'm going to respond to three points that Connor brought up here. Um, first of all, was this like, like doomsday scenario of like the economy falling and uh, the agricultural I industry ceasing to exist, which, and I'm not even going to get into the technological innovation of the strawberry picking uh, example there because um, I, don't, I don't know much about that. And the, I don't know. So anyway, I'm going to go forward here and say, you want to talk about uh, laborers and the agricultural industry? Well, uh, compared to the rest of the world, the agricultural industry in America is in the second to lowest threshold, representing less than 2% of our total GDP. So it can't have that much of an impact, especially considering the fact that we are 70% of a service economy here um, in, in America. And, uh, and also, one other point I'd like to say, when uh, you say that they aren't taking our jobs. I agree, there is some validity there to the fact that uh, there is not necessarily an overlap, that so, most illegal immigrants are not necessarily fluently, uh, fluent in English, so therefore they would not be able to fill certain like communications roles, for example, here. But I'd like to uh, illustrate the circular logic of this argument here that I keep on hearing about how they're not taking illegal, uh, how they're not taking or undercutting American jobs here. So if the uh, hiring of illegal aliens is prevalent in one particular sector of an economy um, such as agriculture and the willingness of foreign wa wa workers to accept lower wages in that sector in which they are prevalent um, uh, depresses wages and uh, this in turn makes employment less attractive for natural born American citizens. And um, I, I got 30 seconds here, so I can't elaborate further on that. And the last thing I want to talk about is retraining, uh, retraining here in the job market here. There are victims of immigration. The immigrants do displace workers. And this is particularly notable in economic downturns when business and investment are depressed. Displaced workers, like a 57 year old uh, janitor, perhaps, who spent his whole life in one industry, you, are you honestly going to expect him to just retrain and switch sectors because he's been out because he's been uh, crowded out by a, a lower wage by a, a foreign a foreigner. I don't think so. So in conclusion here, uh, I just wanted to talk about agriculture is a small percentage of our economy on our GDP, and there's circular logic in the they're taking our jobs thing. And uh, think about think about Bob, my uncle Bob, who uh, who is janitor for for 50 years, and he he doesn't have the skills or, or, or resources to retrain. He wants to retire soon. So why should I care about illegal immigration? It's a question many of you have asked yourself tonight. Tonight, my opponents have engaged in the politics of anything goes. Their distorted facts and cherry-picked data would leave you to believe that we shouldn't care. But this is a room full of intelligent and passionate individuals. I want you all to remember when you first came to Penn State. You said to the rest of the world, I believe in restoring and uniting this university. We will be asked to do the very same for this country when we graduate. We will inherit a $19 trillion deficit. Our minimum wage will be a fraction of what it was for our parents. We will see historical levels of wealth inequality. You see, finances are important to us, and illegal immigrants provide no relief to these burdens. In 2008, Governor Schwarzenegger paced around his office in California. The California budget crisis had hit, and California was $11.2 billion in debt. The governor compared the situation to finding an accident victim on the side of the road bleeding to death and called for a fiscal emergency. It took five years for California's economy to recover. At the end of 2008, 
Supervisor of Los Angeles County, Michael Antonovich, discovered that in his county alone, the total cost of illegal immigrants exceeded $1 billion. Eliminating illegal immigrants in a county 1 34th, the size of the entire state, would have decreased the budget deficit by nearly 10%. In 2012, the Center for Immigration Studies, as well as the Washington Examiner, wanted to take the data into their own hands. What they found was astonishing. They found that illegal immigrants are more than twice as likely to report using at least one welfare program. They also use food programs, Medicaid, and cash programs at a higher rate. In 2013, the Heritage Foundation wanted to put an end to this discussion. What they found was illegal immigrants are the cause of a $54.5 billion deficit annually. That's nearly $14,000 per household. But for us, it's not about the past. It's about the future. How will illegal immigrants affect our plans, our goals, our aspirations, and our dreams? In 2013, the Central Budget Office estimated that illegal immigration reform will result in $250 in additional income to the median American household. It will reduce the budget deficit by $850 million. And by 2023 and 2033, real GDP would increase by $700 billion and $1.4 trillion. Tonight, your decision is about coming together and restoring this great country, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, county by county, and state by state, just like we did here at Penn State. Show my opponents, we are the next Americans, and our patriotism has no side. There is no anti-illegal immigrant America. There is no pro-illegal immigrant America. There's only the United States of America. Prove to my opponents, we care about illegal immigration because we care about our future. Thank you. We're in the home stretch. Bear with me. All right, guys. So my opponent's come up here, and he's basically said that illegal immigrants have a detriment to government policy, fiscal policy, and specifically we're looking at California. And they receive all these benefits and whatnot, you guys got the gist of it. Um, but I have some counter examples. California, because of illegal immigrants, increased their exports to Mexico, just Mexico alone, by 14% which is greater than the 10% statistic that was caught out by the budget deficit um, in California. Illegal immigrants are 25% less likely to receive Medicaid from the government and 37% less likely to receive food stamps. Illegal immigrants don't have social security numbers. They are unable to receive benefits from the government. And illegal immigrants complement our workforce, as, as uh, my partner has said. And we've shown time and time again that not only do they complement our workforce, but they expand it through the use of sending money home. Now, illegal immigrants are here and they're not going anywhere. So we might as well make the best of it, right? Illegal immigrants increase productivity, increase profit, and fill in the gaps that we need to fill that we can't fill with the labor force that we have now. Because believe it or not, we're just too educated to do so. So we need them. We need them to stay here and we need them to fill those gaps that we need in order to increase our productivity, increase, increase um, our GDP, and just fill every, everybody's pockets with money, not just our own, but the ones who are coming here illegally as well. Thank you. So there's a common uh, belief and prevailing thought amongst especially the opposition side that illegal immigrants are a drain to our economy that they consume all these benefits and they take advantage of our system even though they're, they don't belong here. But I'm going to take a step back and look at the, exact, the actual impact on welfare that illegal immigrants have. That hopefully by the end of my speech, you'll see that they are not a drain but actually the tap to the economy, pouring in resources that our government needs to sustain its programs. So in, in order to uh, examine this, the impact of undocumented immigrants on the welfare uh, programs within the United States, I like to state that they contribute more than they actually consume those programs. And if you look at all the data, 
All else held constant, you can make the conclusion that more undocumented immigrants within the system will actually decrease the government's budget deficit. Now I understand at this point a lot of you are probably thinking, how the hell does that, how the hell does that even make sense? <laughs> how the hell does that even make sense? Well, let's break it down. Firstly, let's look at tax contributions. Yes, undocumented immigrants do pay taxes. In fact, uh, 50, 50 to 75 percent of them do, according to the Congressional Budget Office. In fact, many studies, including the one shown over here, have concluded that at the federal level, they actually contribute more to taxes than, they, than the cost of them being in the country. And all these taxes go to various essential uh, welfare programs uh, that, that, ultimately benefit, uh, that ultimately benefit native, uh, native uh, born citizens in the United States. And one particular program that I want to focus on is the, social, is the Social Security program to which undocumented immigrants have contributed in 2012 over $12 billion. And Social Security at this point is so important to the US economy because of the fact that the US has an aging population. And because of the fact that uh, if, uh, once, once that population reaches the re retirement age, we either need more people to buy into the system which, which we can achieve through undocumented immigrants paying taxes or we'll have to increase the income tax. And of course, nobody likes higher income taxes. So overall, uh, if, if we, if, if we look, overall, if we look at the actual statistics behind uh, the patterns that, uh, that illegal immigrants have behind consumption of welfare, we, we notice that, that illegal immigrants on average actually consume fewer welfare benefits than native-born citizens. And of course, this makes sense because of the fact that they are not even eligible for most of the benefits that are otherwise available to US citizens. And they are not eligible for benefits such as unemployment benefits, such as Medicare, such as Social Security. And more importantly, the Cato Institute in 2013 conducted a study and concluded that, uh, that when compared to native-born citizens, undocumented immigrants are 25% or less likely to uh, receive Medicaid and 37% less likely to receive food stamps. Considering all of this, weighing the tax contribution of undocumented immigrants and comparing it to the actual benefits they receive, most, most of which they're not even eligible for, we can conclude that as far as social welfare is concerned, undocumented immigrants are a net benefit, not a net cost, as you can see. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, again. Now, I'd like to rebut several of their arguments, including uh, the argument made by the previous speaker and certain speakers before them. First of all, let's clear certain things out. FAIR Institute, uh, FAIR, it's a think tank, it estimates that, state, that at state and local levels, illegal immigrants cost this economy $113 billion. That's a cost, it's not a benefit. And the tax contributions of the illegal immigrants is just $13 billion. Going further, the education of the children of these illegal aliens, who a lot of times illegal aliens use as anchors, and this is, this is a very common fact, uh, as anchors because certain times um, the children of these illegal, uh, illegal immigrants are born in the United States, and by default they get U.S. citizenship, and they also uh, they also, at that point, qualify to get welfare benefits from the U.S. government. That specific cost, and that is at the point when uh, it's not confirmed as to how many illegal immigrants actually pay tax. Yes, there are a certain number of illegal immigrants that pay taxes, but understand that it's still $100 billion short of what it's supposed to be. Now, education for the children of illegal immigrants constitutes the single largest cost to taxpayers at an annual price tag of $52 billion. That's a pretty big price tag. Uh, now, a couple of things. First of all, a lot of the arguments that we have heard from this side uh, has, to do with the agricultural has, to with, has to do with the agricultural sectors. We have mentioned the fact that the agricultural sector is less than 2% of the economy. And thirdly, they have... Uh, they have accused, uh, not accused, but they have implicitly mentioned that we are trying to portray illegal immigrants as what Irishmen were portrayed in a certain, uh, at a previous time. That's not true. 
we have repeatedly mentioned that we acknowledge certain benefits provided by illegal immigrants to certain parts of the economy, but those are, not, but those are far outweighed by the costs. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at this point, uh, after hearing all these arguments, uh, I'd like to come here and put things in perspective and look at what this debate is really about and what it really boils down to. So Jonas came here and talked about how remittance payments are an excellent example of an unexpected economic benefit to the U.S. economy because of the fact that it increases net, net exports and it improves the financial market. Connor came up here and talked about how immig illegal immigrants are important to the labor force and how they don't compete, but they complete and complement it. And that is so important to bolstering our economic performance. And thirdly, I talked about how significantly illegal immigrants contribute towards benefits they don't even receive. But put putting all that aside, let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. What does it really mean when we say that an immigrant, a worker, is illegal? Let's take a look at this number. That is $18 trillion, the U.S. national nominal GDP in 2015. This is more than just a number. This debate transcends facts and figures that either side is throwing at you. The economy is not driven by numbers. It is driven by people. It is driven by workers. To emphasize the illegality of these workers, we, by doing that, we are, we are denying their contribution, their effort towards this total, which is a symbol of our economic clout in the international community. And that is dehumanizing to these people just because of the fact that they crossed a border. But putting all these things in perspective, put, put, setting aside the unfairness of this implication, to say that, uh, that workers in an economy for which there is a demand for them, where there is a demand for such workers, to say that they are a cost to such an economy just flies in the face of economic reality. And putting everything together, looking at the bigger picture, you can really see that the true net cost of the U.S. economy are sentiments of ethnocentrism, of isolationism, and of nationalism. Thank you very much, and have a great evening. How are you doing, folks? Um, all right, so I'm going to uh, close this debate with a couple points of crystallization that I think were unclear after this and uh, my closing remarks. First, I wanted to comment on Jonas's private remittances argument. I think it was a clever argument that they're sending these private remittances to Mexico and then they're in turn buying these back in exports. But the thing is, a couple problems with that here. Um, one, U.S. is a net importer, not a net exporter. Um, so, and there's a heck of a lot of other countries exporting um, in the world. So well, who's to say that every single cent of those private remittances, which are 70% of the cash inflow to Mexico, are actually coming back into the U.S.? And I'd also like to talk, he mentioned about, there's talk about uh, the fiscal deficit and the federal deficit. So these private remittances are going uh, a negative in the United States current account balance. So it's furthering our fiscal burden because when we send out these private remittances, they have to be balanced by the financial and capital account. Um, and uh, even further, uh, so these uh, in, in remittances have been growing since 2008. Uh, in response to Ayad's argument about the, the crime and the violence, uh, uh, illegal immigrants make up eight to, uh, three to eight percent of the population, but are, are in, responsible for 22 to 30 percent, seven percent of all murders. That's 10 times uh, U.S. inhabitants. And then uh, my last point of crystallization before I get to my closing remarks I wanted to touch on here was the fact of uh, the fact that they contribute to our, um, our government deficit and, and they're actually a plus. And I'll just cite one fact here, that they, uh, education accounts for uh, of illegal immigrant children who have been naturalized and are in fact legal citizens, but they've came in here because both of their parents are illegal. That accounts for $52 billion in federal taxes every year educating these children. And uh, $52 billion in, in, in taxes, uh, and it's by far the biggest cost to American taxpayers by far. So it, what has opposition brought you here tonight? We have shown you that illegal immigration undercuts the American dream. It aggravates our fiscal crisis by adding billions of dollars in health care and education. It, it burdens our criminal justice system and the infrastructure of our public safety. Uh, I'll leave you this with a remark by Pulitzer Prize winner George Will. If those who wrote and ratified the 14th Amendment, uh, which defines U.S. citizenship, 
uh, had imagined these laws restricting immigration and had anticipated these huge waves of illegal immigration, is it truly reasonable to presume that they would have wanted to provide the reward of citizenship to these violators? I think not. Thank you. I want to come to the great USA The people are telling me to stay away I'll pick your fruit and work for very cheap I'm just trying to feed my family I can lower your costs so it's easy to see I'll be an asset your economy yeah. but now or maybe we better build a wall and spend the money so your wages don't fall protect the jobs of the workers in the states keep the terrorists out of our land Maybe it's time to take a heart and stand To keep our country safe and great Now I'm not Irish, I'm Scottish My great-grandfather came from Scotland Settled in Baltimore and then began Working any job he could find we took over the land when the guns were hot and called ourselves the great melting pot. Do we want to leave that name behind? Should we offer amnesty, giving millions a chance at self-sufficiency? Or lock them up and send them all away? Some say the immigrants will lower costs. Some say too many jobs are lost. Now we want to know what you have to say. Should we tighten our immigration laws or let the workers come into our halls? That's why we're having this important debate. So get your phones out now. I think we got that problem fixed. Let's all vote to welcome immigrants or just put them on a boat. Because a better economy is what we all want to create. Yeah, a better economy is what we all want to create. Thank great. you all very much. Thank you very much for coming to the debate. We really appreciate it. You've been a fantastic audience, very attentive, and really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So now that we've had a very insightful and informative debate, we're going to kind of turn to you guys to render a verdict. So the I'm polls are closed, and we have a winner. Please give a warm round of applause to Team McIntaffer. They got 57% of the vote. And also a round of applause to Team Manzik. They did a great job as well. <laughs>